HMS King George V. Tonnage, 35,000. Armament, 10 14-inch guns, 16 5.25 multiple pom-poms, and other anti-aircraft weapons. Complement, 1,500. Now, what do these facts tell us? First, that a battleship is a gigantic seagoing gun platform. Second, that 1,500 men are required to steam the ship and keep her guns firing. In this picture, you will see what sort of lives these men lead, how and where they sleep, eat, work, and pass their spare time. When she is in harbor, stores are taken aboard. For weeks on end, this seagoing community has to be entirely self-supporting. Food and drink for the men, fuel for the engines, munitions for the guns must be stored away. Meanwhile, deep down in the ship, there are jobs to be done that cannot be carried out at sea. In the boiler room, men enter the boilers to scrub the boiler tubes, through which water, transformed into steam, circulates to provide the ship's driving power. In harbor, the evaporator tubes are taken out for cleaning. At sea, salt water is sucked into these evaporators and distilled into fresh water. And from time to time, the salt deposit has to be removed. Maintenance work is done to the engines. In the middle of the morning, there's a stand-easy period. Some of the men visit the pay office. As much as 15,000 pounds in cash is carried aboard a battleship. It's used for such things as foreign harbor dues, pilotage, local stores, and sometimes fuel. The department also acts as a post office and savings bank. Whenever the ship touches port, mail from home is distributed. Divine service is held before the day's work begins. Attendance is voluntary. Daily prayers for the ship's company are also held on the upper deck after morning divisions. HMS King George V keeps the late King George's Bible in a place of honor. A Church of England chaplain is stationed in every big ship, and each squadron carries one Roman Catholic priest and one minister of each of the other major denominations. Men are free to go to whichever ship is holding the particular service they favor. At sea, services are held when conditions permit. There are, of course, many differences between sea and harbor routine. From the bridge, the horizon is constantly scanned for any sign of the enemy. When entering or leaving harbor, the captain is always at his place on the bridge. Down below, the engineer officer of the watch can tell if there's any check in the smooth running of his engines merely by watching this large panel of pressure gauges, revolution counters, and other instruments. Many specialist craftsmen are included in the ship's company. Some are engaged in the most unexpected trades. The print rooms, for instance, issue all daily orders for distribution throughout the ship. In the dark room, there is all the equipment necessary for developing and processing the photographs taken from the ship's reconnaissance plane. The plane, by the way, is launched by catapult. When it returns, it lands on the sea alongside the ship and is then hoisted inboard by crane. In the machine shop, repairs to engines or adjustments to instruments are carried out. Providing food and drink for the crew of a battleship is a job for catering experts. Rum is the Navy's traditional drink. It is usually served at midday. The ration is drawn by the leading hand of each mess, and distribution is checked by the ship's supply petty officer, who makes sure the correct amount is issued according to the number of men in the particular mess. The ration is one-eighth of a pint per man, diluted with twice the amount of water. When it is so mixed, it is called grog. The rum in the barrel is already diluted. The ship has its own bakery, which supplies crisp new loaves every day. And each day, 1,000 pounds of flour are used to make 1,300 pounds of bread. The 
The food is cooked in several galleys. Don't forget there are 1,500 men aboard, as many as could be accommodated by the largest hotels on land. Mincing machines and potato slicers are among the modern kitchen equipment aboard. Between four and 5,000 meals are served daily. This oven, with its many shelves into which the pies are being put, is specially constructed for mass baking. Before the meal is served to the men, it has to be approved by an officer. This is part of the paymaster commander's duties. He carefully samples all the dishes, including the soup. The tables are here being laid on one of the mess decks. The ship's company is divided into several messes, one to each department. Each has its own mess deck. The term deck is broadly used and doesn't only mean that part of the ship that is open to the sky. In the case of the mess deck, it means the living space. Each morning, different members of the mess are detailed off for mess duties, such as preparing tables and serving food. Here's the boys' mess deck. In the King George V, there are 200 lads under 18. They are apprentices, learning the trade of seamanship. The officers' quarters are separate from those of the men. Their general living space is known as the wardroom. The midday meal is served there from 12.30 to 1.30. There are no set places. Everyone sits where he pleases, irrespective of rank. The stewards and Royal Marines serving the meal are not carried solely for this purpose. When the ship goes into action, they have other vital work to do, as you'll see later. The ship's canteen has no hard and fast service times. It's open during stand-easy periods and at other times when a large number of men are off duty. A large stock is carried and you can buy things for yourself and for the mess. They get things cheap, too. Everything is duty-free at sea, and some goods are kept at pre-war prices. Off-duty time is spent on the mess deck. There's not much room in this floating gun battery, but there's plenty of choice of pastimes and hobbies. The interior of the ship is air-conditioned. Air is driven by fans through trunking to all parts, and the temperature thermostatically controlled. It takes 300 miles of cable to circulate electric current throughout the ship, and 5,000 electric light bulbs are used. Sailors are traditionally clever with their hands and patient model makers. They used to build model ships inside bottles. Now they use electric light bulbs. There's a library on board with a good supply of books. A battleship sick bay is a miniature hospital. The care and attention given to men when they are ill or wounded is as good as any ashore. Three doctors and eight hospital train attendants make up the staff. The equipment is up to the highest standards and includes X-ray apparatus. Here, a blood pressure test is being made. And here, a microscope is being used to examine a blood sample. When you have 1,500 people together, you always get a certain amount of ordinary sickness. In the sick bay, they can treat anything from a bilious attack to broken limbs. The most important part of the battleship is the gun turrets. Here's the entrance to one of the main armament turrets with its 14-inch guns. Gun drill is starting. The men wear protective anti-flash helmets and gloves. You remember about wardroom attendants having other jobs. Maybe you notice this chap serving there. Now he's at the elevation and depression control. All guns are directed from a central position high up on the mast known as gunnery control. But in case of need, each turret is self-contained. This is the local control rangefinder at work. When under local control, the officer of the quarters gives directions to the guns, viewing the target through a periscope. Now the guns are being loaded. See the breeches rising in the lower half of the picture. Ammunition is sent up from the magazine by a lift, known as the cage. There's one coming up in the foreground. 
After the shell and charges are pushed home, the cage goes down and the gun is elevated to its firing position. Let's watch that in detail. Everything is controlled by the man with the lever. The bridge rises and opens. Over goes another lever. Up comes the cage and stops in the first position. Another lever. A rammer drives a shell through the top chamber of the cage into the bridge. The cage comes up a little further. The rammer passes through the second chamber and drives home a charge of cordite. The cage moves up again and a second charge is driven in. A pull on the lever and the cage goes down. The bridge closes and is lowered, thus elevating the muzzle ready for firing. At the end of the day, hammocks are slung. When not in use, the hammocks are stowed away in a corner of the mess deck. First, they sling the hammock from the hooks and bars in the deck head without unlashing it. Next, the lashing is removed. The hammock is opened out and a stretcher placed at the head to keep it open. The important thing is to make the ends fast securely. Sailors have the knack of making the soundest knots in the simplest way. A wash before turning in. Hot and cold water is laid on, and for those who wish, there are showers. Once you get used to the swinging, a hammock is very comfortable. Now that is a fairly comprehensive view of routine life on board a battleship. But there's one side of it we haven't shown, the dangers and risks of war. On any day at any time may come the call to action. It will probably come through the central communications office, the nerve center of the ship. Messages are sent out and received in code. These require decoding, which is a specialized job. The message is sent through a pneumatic tube to the officer concerned, in this case, the Admiral. A staff meeting is in progress when the message is brought in by his secretary. The Admiral gives it to the fleet navigating officer, who plots the enemy according to the position given in the message. A staff officer writes at the Admiral's dictation the signal which is to be transmitted to the other ships of the fleet. All immediate orders to the crew are broadcast throughout the ship by loudspeaker. At the command action stations, the men leave whatever they may be doing and hurry to their posts. Many hours or even days may elapse before contact is made. But through the snow, ice and winds of the Arctic, she steams proudly on, seeking out the enemy. she sail the seas, with her go aircraft carriers and other mighty men of war. As she sails forth at the head of the fleet, there may come at any moment that encounter with the enemy which will bring forth the finest and best from every man aboard. That spirit which will uphold the tradition and reputation associated with her name, HMS King George V. <laughs> 